One of those ideas had to do with the light from a moving object. The images by which we see the world are made of light and are carried at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers a second. You might think that the image of me should be moving out ahead of me at the speed of light plus the speed of the bicycle. If I'm moving towards you faster than a horse and cart, then my image should be approaching you exactly that much faster. My image ought to arrive earlier. But in reality, you don't see any time delay. In a near collision, for example, you always see everything happen at once. Horse, cart, swerve, bicycle, all simultaneous. But how would it look if it were proper to add the velocities? Since I'm heading towards you, you'd add my speed to the speed of light. So my image ought to arrive before the image of the horse and cart. I'd be cycling towards you quite normally. To me, a collision would suddenly seem imminent. But you'd see me swerve for no apparent reason and have a collision with nothing. Now, the horse and cart aren't headed towards you. Their image would arrive only at the speed of light. Could it seem to me that I just missed colliding while to you it wasn't even close? In precise laboratory experiments, scientists have never observed any such thing. If the world is to be understood, if we are to avoid logical paradoxes when traveling at high speeds, then there are certain rules which must be obeyed. Einstein called these rules the special theory of relativity. Light from a moving object travels at the same speed, no matter whether the object is at rest or in motion. Thou shalt not add my speed to the speed of light. Also, no material object can travel at or beyond the speed of light. There's nothing in physics that prevents you from traveling as close to the speed of light as you like. 99.9% .9 the speed of light is just fine. But no matter how hard you try, you can never gain that last decimal point. For the world to be logically consistent, there must be a cosmic speed limit. The crack of a whip is due to its tip moving faster than the speed of sound. It makes a shockwave, a small sonic boom in the Italian countryside. A thunderclap has a similar origin. So does the sound of a supersonic airplane. So why is the speed of light a barrier? any more than the speed of sound? The answer is not just that light travels about a million times faster than sound. It's not merely an engineering problem like the supersonic airplane. Instead, the light barrier is a fundamental law of nature, as basic as gravity. Einstein found his absolute framework for the world, this sturdy pillar among all the relative motions of the cosmos. Light travels just as fast no matter how its source is moving. The speed of light is constant, relative to everything else. Nothing can ever catch up with light. Einstein's prohibition against traveling faster than light seems to clash with our common sense notions. But why should we expect our common sense notions to have any reliability uh, in a matter of this sort? Why should our experience at 10 kilometers an hour constrain the laws of nature at 300,000 kilometers a second. Relativity sets limits on what humans ultimately can do. The universe is not required to be in perfect harmony with human ambition. Imagine a place where the speed of light isn't its true value of 300,000 kilometers a second, but something a lot less, let's say 40 kilometers an hour, and strictly enforced. Just as in the real world, we can never reach the speed of light. The commandment here is still, thou shalt not travel faster than light. But we can do thought experiments on what happens near the speed of light, here 40 kilometers an hour, the speed of a motor scooter. You can't break the laws of nature. There are no penalties for doing so. The real world, and this one, are merely so arranged that transgressions can't happen. The job of physics 
is to find out what those laws are. Before Einstein, physicists thought that there were privileged frames of reference, some special places and times against which everything else had to be measured. Einstein encountered a similar notion in human affairs, the idea that the customs of a particular nation, his native Germany or Italy or anywhere, are the standard against which all other societies must be measured. But Einstein rejected the strident nationalism of his time. He believed every culture had its own validity. And also in physics, he understood that there are no privileged frames of reference. Every observer, in any place, time, or motion, must deduce the same laws of nature. Caldo. A speed is simply how much space you cover in a given time. As any kid on a motor scooter knows, <laughs> Since near the velocity of light, we cannot simply add speeds. The familiar notions of absolute space and absolute time, independent of your relative motion, must give way. That's why, as Einstein showed, funny things have to happen close to the speed of light. There are conventional perspectives of space and time strangely change. Your nose is just a little closer to me than your ears. Light reflected off your nose reaches me just an instant in time before your ears. But suppose I had a magic camera so that I could see your nose and your ears at precisely the same instant. With such a camera, you could take some pretty interesting pictures. Paolo says goodbye to his little brother Vincenzo. And rides off. He's now going more than half the speed of light. He's almost catching up with his own light waves. This compresses the light waves in front of him, and his image becomes blue. The shorter wavelength is what makes blue light waves blue. Also, Paolo becomes skinny in the direction of motion. This isn't just some optical illusion. It really happens when you travel near the speed of light. As he roars away, he leaves his own light waves stretched out behind him. Long light waves are red. We say that his receding image is red-shifted. Now, Paolo leaves for a short tour of the countryside. He experiences something even stranger. Everything he can see is squeezed into a moving window just ahead of him, blue-shifted at the center, red-shifted at the edges. To a passerby, Paolo appears blue-shifted when approaching, red-shifted when receding. But to him, the entire world is both coming and going at nearly the speed of light. Roadside houses and trees that he's already gone past still appear to him at the edge of his forward field of view, but distorted and red-shifted. When he slows down, everything again looks normal. Only very close to the speed of light does the visible world get squeezed into a kind of tunnel. You would really see these distortions if you could travel near the speed of light. Someday, perhaps, interstellar navigators will take their bearings on stars behind them, whose images have all crowded together on the forward view screen. The most bizarre aspect of traveling near the speed of light is that time slows down. All clocks, mechanical and biological, tick more slowly near the speed of light. But stationary clocks tick at their usual rate. If we travel close to light speed, we age more slowly than those we left behind. Paolo's watch and his internal sense of time show that he's been gone from his friends for only a few minutes. But from their point of view, he has been away for many decades. His friends have grown up, moved on, and died. And his younger brother has been patiently waiting for him all this time. The two brothers experience the paradox of time dilation. They've encountered Einstein's special relativity. No chance.
This was just a thought experiment, but atomic particles traveling near the speed of light do decay more slowly than stationary particles. As strange and counterintuitive as it seems, time dilation is a law of nature. Traveling close to the speed of light is a kind of elixir of life. Because time slows down close to the speed of light, special relativity provides us with a means of going to the stars. This region of northern Italy is not only the cauldron of some of the thinking of the young Albert Einstein, it is also the home of another great genius who lived 400 years earlier, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo delighted in climbing these hills and viewing the ground from a great height as if he were soaring like a bird. He drew the first aerial views of landscapes, villages, fortifications. I've been talking about Einstein in and around this town of Vinci in which Leonardo grew up. Einstein greatly respected Leonardo and their spirits in some sense inhabit this countryside still. Among Leonardo's many accomplishments in painting, sculpture, architecture, natural history, anatomy, geology, civil and military engineering, he had a great passion. He wished to construct a machine which would fly. He made sketches of such machines, built miniature models, constructed great full-scale prototypes. And not a one of them ever worked. Mainly because there were no machines of adequate capacity available in his time. The technology was just not ready. The designs, however, were brilliant. For example, this bird-like machine here in the Leonardo Museum in the town of Vinci. Leonardo's great designs encouraged engineers in later epochs, although Leonardo himself was very depressed at these failures. But it's not his fault he was trapped in the 15th century. A somewhat similar case occurred in 1939, when a group of engineers calling themselves the British Interplanetary Society decided to design a ship which would carry people to the moon. Now, it was by no means the same design as the Apollo ship, which actually took people to the moon some years later. But that design suggested that a mission to the moon might one day be a practical signing of the international treaty forbidding nuclear weapons explosions in space.